of the Bible to the very end. So how can we come up with a definition that encapsulates all of that? And that's very hard to do. But the one that we're going to work with today, I like how Richard Lentz kind of looks at the Bible and sums it up this way. The core idea behind holiness is absolute moral purity. God is not only perfectly good, he is the very source and standard of goodness. And that's a dilemma. That's a dilemma. That's a dilemma for Moses. It's a dilemma for you. It's a problem for me. Do not come any closer, God says. Do not come any closer. God's holiness is dangerous. And for the rest of Moses' life, he knows to the very core of his being that God is holy because we see it coming up over and over and over again. Later in his life, Moses is going to describe God as a consuming fire, clearly probably from this encounter that he has with God. When Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, so spoiler alert, they do get out, in case you're wondering, right? He leads them through the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea, brings the Red Sea back down, destroys the Egyptian army. Moses breaks into worship, and what is the theme of his worship song? Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders holiness, absolute moral purity and goodness. Even later, Moses leads the Israelites into the wilderness for 40 years. And Moses is on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and he encounters God and he asks God a very, very bold question. He says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And what is God's response to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen because God is holy. This is a dilemma for Moses. What is his dilemma? He wants to see the glory of God. But God is holy and Moses is not. What is our dilemma? We want to see the glory of God. But God is holy and we are not. What do we do with God's holiness? What do we do? I think there's two false approaches that we want uh, to avoid. There's probably more than two, but we're just going to focus on two just this morning together. The first false approach is that we think too highly of our own holiness. We say, God is holy, and therefore, I better clean myself up. I better work harder. I better get holier. And you know why I'm at it? I'm going to clean up the people around me, too. You know, we become judgmental. We become legalistic. We think God's holy. And if I'm going to ever please him and if I'm ever going to be able to earn my way into his presence, I better get super holy as well. Now, this approach does get one thing right. God is holy. But we will never, ever be able to in our own strength, to be holy enough to earn the favor of a majestic, awesome, glorious, consuming fire God, ever. So the first wrong approach is to think too highly of our own holiness. The second wrong approach is to think too lowly of God's holiness. This approach kind of says, well, you know, I mean, I get it. I understand that I'm sinful, but, you know, God's my buddy. He's just like that old smiling dude in the sky. I sin a little, sometimes a lot, but he's cool with it because he just wants to hang out with me. He's cool. This is foolishness. This is foolishness because God is holy. God is holy. 
and he cannot overlook sin. That would be like him saying, hmm, I guess I'm not that majestic. I guess I'm not that amazing. I guess I'm not that awesome that I'm just going to mix with sin. He can't do it by his very nature as God. So this false approach does get one thing right, that you and I and Moses are indeed sinners. But it reshapes God into some irrelevant buddy in the sky who just winks his eye at our sin and brokenness. So the first wrong approach is to think too highly of our own holiness. The second is to think too lowly of God's holiness. But what if we want to uphold God's holiness and we want to recognize the fact that we are indeed sinful, but we want desperately to see the glory of God? That, my friends, is a dilemma. But in Christ Jesus, thanks be to God, there is a solution. That God, God came in human flesh, fully God, fully man, took our sin, lived a sinless life. Even though he was innocent, he bore our pain, our shame, our suffering, our judgment, our sin. And if we trust in Jesus, trust who he says that he is in the scriptures, and trust that he's powerful enough to actually do what he promises to do, we get wrapped up in Jesus like a flame-repellent suit, and he takes us into the very majesty of God, the throne of Father God, and we do not get burned up because he protects us and he wraps us up. And we can say, like Moses, our God is a consuming fire. Not our God's a consuming fire, run, right? That's, that's different, but, but our God is a consuming fire and it's majestic and it's beautiful and it's awesome. Everybody knows this about fire, right? There's time where you see fire, you run because it's powerful and it's dangerous. But there are other times when you look at fire and you're just like, this is so beautiful, so majestic, so amazing. Our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire fire, but thanks be to God, we have Christ Jesus. Now, why does God do this for us? Why? Why does God do this for us? Because he's not only holy, but he's also loving. In many ways, the whole Bible is that story, is how does a holy God love an unholy people like you and I? How does he do it? Because he's loving. Do we see that God is loving? Am I just pushing this into Exodus 3? I don't think I am. I think that we see it in Exodus 3. So let's continue on. Then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Smart man, Moses. Okay. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Not only do we see that God is holy, but God makes it clear to Moses here that he is a covenant-keeping God, a covenant-keeping God. Now, that might be strange language, but it's very biblical language. Covenant. God makes covenants. He makes promises. And so maybe to get our head around what covenant-keeping God means, here's a, a working definition for us all this morning. God is a personal God who keeps his promises to his people. Let's look at this passage again, very quickly together. Because what does God say? God says, I'm God of the past. I'm the God of your ancestors, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But I'm also God of the future because I have seen the misery and I hear the cries of my people. And I'm also a God of the future because I'm going to bring you all out of Egypt, and I'm going to lead you into the promised 
land. This is what God tells Moses. You go into the past, I'm there. Present suffering and hurt, I am here. Worried about the future, I am there. And I keep my promises. I keep my promises. I'm a covenant-keeping God. Sometimes they feel long delayed, particularly in our own kind of human understanding. And sometimes we suffer. But God is a covenant-keeping God. Moses needed to be reminded. The Israelites needed to be reminded. Some of you may need to be reminded this morning that God keeps his promises to his people. He keeps them. And that is why, as Christ followers, it's so important that we're reading our Bibles, soaking in God's promises, marinating in God's promises. I know we're almost to lunch. I probably shouldn't have used the word marinate, but nevertheless, right? Marinating in God's promises, right? Because we need to know, what has God promised me? Because he's a promise keeper. He's a covenant-keeping God. Now let me pause here for a second. Because it may be that someone in this audience throughout your life has really not had very many dependable people. Maybe your parents weren't dependable. Maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend or a string of long relationships, they weren't dependable. You know, maybe you've been hurt by friends or by leaders in your life. Some of you may have been in churches and you've been church hurt by pastors or staff. This is hard for you. dependability from other human beings. And my prayer for you this morning is that you can understand what it means to have a covenant-keeping God as your God. That he keeps his promises. That is dependable. Even when we face hardship and suffering, because there will be times of that in life, And then you can stake your claim in our covenant-keeping God. That's my prayer for you this morning. Okay. Now, we see that God is revealing himself to Moses. This is who I am. I've not forgotten the Israelites. I've not forgotten you. I'm a covenant-keeping God. I'm a holy God. And then... What we hear God say is, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This all began so well for Moses, didn't it? Like he'd won the jackpot or some like 80s game show. 80s game show, so I'm going to lose probably about half the people in this room. All right, so my apologies. But right, cool burning bush. Ding, ding, ding. That's the 80s game show part, by the way. Okay? Right? Cool burning bush. You know, covenant keeping holy God. Ding, ding, ding. I've not forgotten Israel. Ding, ding, ding. And now, Moses, I'm going to use you to do it. Wah, wah, wah. Right? That's what it must feel like to Moses. Okay? That's what it feels like to Moses. God has been revealing himself to Moses, and now it is time for Moses to reveal himself himself to God, and what we discover and Moses shows us is that at this point, he's not so much a giant of the faith as he is more of a a gnat of the faith. He's more a gnat of the faith because what does Moses say to God? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I, right? Is he being humble Is he being stubborn? Is it a mixture of both? I tend to think that he's being stubborn because this is the first of five times that Moses is going to say, I don't really want to do that, okay? The first of five times. I think he's being a little stubborn here, but honestly, it doesn't matter in the end because Moses is not having this call from the Lord. The Lord calls, and Moses is like, no thanks, no thanks, right? But, you know, we got to give Moses a break because we are so often like this, are we not? We're so often like this. We pray, we seek the Lord, we say, God, move in my life, move in this area, move in that area. And when he comes through, and then he says, and I'm going to ask you to do something in response, we're like, wait, whoa. 
Like, I have to participate? I did not realize that the Christian life was a participatory sport. I thought, you did things for me, and I just kind of sat around, right? That's what I thought this life was. We say, oh, God, you know, I've really been wrestling with comparing myself to others, Lord, and it makes me depressed, and it makes me anxious. Oh, God, please come through in my life. And God says, I'm going to do it. Now, I want you to delete all the social media apps that force you to compare yourself to other people and make you depressed. And it's like, wah, wah, wah. That's what it feels like, right? It's like, God, I want you so to led by the Holy Spirit. I want to hear your voice. And he says, I'm going to answer that prayer. And it's like, ding, ding, ding. So you can get up and read the Bible and pray. That's what it feels like, right? You think you hit the jackpot, but then God asks us to participate. Now listen to me. I'm not themselves. Please don't hear that. power, but he often asks for our participation. Does he need you or I to do anything in the universe? No, he is God, but he knows what is good and best for us, and he calls us to participate, and that's hard sometimes. So, but hey, it is us too. be with you. You will worship God on this mountain. You will worship God on this mountain. Hey, Moses, God says, weren't you listening? This is really not about you. It's about me. To you, I am going to be with you. It's my strength my grace, my power. And isn't that what faith really is? Isn't it trusting what someone tells us and believing that they have the power to accomplish what they say? Let me give you an example. Let's say I tell my children, I'm going to take you to Disney World. And I'm not a very trustworthy person. I make promises and break them all the time. They're like, "Mm, I lack faith in you. And I lack faith in that promise, right? Or maybe I'm trustworthy but I'm powerless. So they're like, yeah, dad would love to take me to Disney World, but he ain't got the money to do it. You know, when it comes to that, he's powerless, right? So they lack faith in me. They can't trust what I say. And even if they trust what they say, they know I'm powerless to accomplish it. And it's not just about promises, right? It's about warnings too. Now we tend to think of faith in positive terms, and I think that's right and good, and that is the overall trajectory of the Bible. But it's warnings too. Because remember, Moses is going to go and give lots of warnings to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's going to be like, I lack faith in God, so why should I be concerned about these warnings? So let's use the kid example again, right? I tell my children, you do your chores, or I'm taking phones away tonight, right? Now if they think, he's never going to do it, they lack faith in me, and they lack faith in that promise slash warning. Or maybe they think he'd like to, but he's a pushover, and I know he's powerless to actually do it. Um, They lack faith in me. Sorry, I'm clearly doing therapy with you here this morning, so (laughs) pray pray for me, right? Our, our Our modern notion of just have faith or just believe, I'm sorry, is a ridiculous notion. Faith in who? Belief in who? Faith and belief are in something, or in this case, in someone. When we have faith in God, we are saying, I trust you, I believe what you're saying, and you have the power to do it. That is faith. But Moses at this point is like, "Mm, no, no. I, you know, I lack that kind of faith. So what does God do? He reveals more of himself to Moses. He reveals more of himself to Moses. So Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? 
then what shall I tell him? Moses is coming up with more excuses, right? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. Well, that's cryptic, right? This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. God reveals himself to Moses as the I am or Yahweh. The I am or Yahweh. Look at verse 14 with me one more time. God calls himself the I am three times. I am, who I am, and then again, I am has sent you. But he says it again in verse 15, but we don't quite see it, right? Because this word Lord here is Yahweh. So for those of you who like a little Bible trivia, these few moments of the sermon are for you. You're welcome, right? Um, the Lord, <laughs> the Lord, all capital, L-O-R-D, is the Hebrew word Yahweh. And most of our English translations do not translate it Yahweh out of respect for God's name. So if you're reading your New Testament, or your, well, yeah, New Testament and Old Testament, if you're reading your Bible, typically, if you see this word, all capitalized, Lord, that is the word Yahweh. And Yahweh is directly related to the words I am. Okay? Enough with the Bible trivia. What the heck? <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome, Juan. That one was for you, buddy. So, I am, or calls himself, Yahweh. Now, it's a matter of debate. It's a matter of debate. But I think most scholars would agree that God is saying something like this to Moses and to us. I am eternal. I'm unchanging. I'm self-sufficient. I have no needs. I am past, present, future. Everything exists because of me. I am not dependent on anything. I don't get tired, and I don't get worried. It's something like this. Moses says, God, what is your name? And God says something like existence itself. It's like the ultimate mic drop, right? Moses, God, what's your name? God, existence. Boom. I mean, how do you respond to that, right? Existence. I am. I am. Right? So what are you worried about? And that is why right after God reveals himself as I am, what does he say to Moses? Go. In the very next verse. <laughs> Go. Right? Go. And then he gives them the whole plan. He says, all right, now you're going to go. You're going to go to the Israelite leaders. This is what you're going to say. Then you're going to go to Pharaoh, and this is what you're going to say. And then you're going to lead the Israelites out, and this is what you're going to do. I'm going to give you the whole plan. And really, let's be honest, it's all about me, God says. I'm the I am, so don't worry about it, right? Don't worry. And what does Moses do? Worries. He worries. He worries, right? So he comes up with a new excuse in chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me? Or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. God has just told him they're going to believe you. And so once again, faith is believing what a person says and believing that they have the power to do it. Clearly, Moses is lacking faith at this point. So God is going to reveal something new about himself to Moses, and he's going to reveal that he is powerful. As if that's not implied when you say, I'm existence itself. But nevertheless, he's working with Moses here, right? So he says, I'm powerful. And he's going to prove he's powerful by giving Moses two signs. And if you know this story or if you've seen the movies, right? He has Moses take a staff, throw it on the ground, turns the staff to a snake, turns the snake back to a staff, has Moses pick it back up. Second sign, takes Moses' hand, gives it a very visible skin disease, and then heals the hand back to normal. And Moses is like, wow, that's cool. This God's pretty powerful. And Moses' response, of course, is, I'm going to go. It's not. It's actually, it's another excuse, in case you're wondering. It's another excuse. That's what Moses gives. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. Now, Moses is getting nice and polite here, right? Pardon. Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. But what does God say? The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? 
Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Moses is not getting it. God's like, okay, just go back to the last few moments. Think about all the things I've revealed about myself to you. Got it? Good. And he says again, now go. Now go. And we get Moses' fifth excuse. His fifth excuse. But this time, it's not so much as an excuse as it is just an outright refusal to do it. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Again, very polite, very polite. And this may or may not be significant, but notice he's already, God's already told him his name, but you'll, you'll note that, that, that Moses is not calling him by that name, right? Because for it to be Yahweh, it's got to be all capital letters. This is not Yahweh. This is just like, you know, sir, right? So God said, this is my name. And Moses is like, I'm not going to use that name, right? I'm just going to call you sir, be really polite, and tell you I don't want to do this. I'm, that, may be more, that, that may not be anything. It may not be significant, but I thought I'd point it out, right? And then we see for the first time in this whole encounter that, what does it say about God? The Lord's anger burned against Moses. Now, that's interesting, right? That's the first time we hear about God's anger. But I do think there's something different about this, right? Because at least in the other times, Moses is trying to come up with some excuse. I'm slow of speech. I don't know your name. They won't listen to me. On this fifth encounter, he's just like, I don't want to do it. And the Lord's anger burned against Moses. But even then, even then, God is patient with Moses. God is incredibly patient. What does he say? What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff, right? Final verse here. But take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Now, I may be stretching this a bit here, so I'll be the first to admit, but this last verse makes me laugh. Because I picture, finally, after all of this, Moses running off to do what God has already commanded him to do, but he's, like, forgotten his staff. And God's like, Moses, <laughs> Moses, the staff, buddy. You know the staff I turned into a snake, turned back into a staff? The staff that you're going to use to do all those signs and wonders in Egypt? Get your staff, buddy. For those of you, of you who have kids, I, I, I almost feel like it's like when you're trying to get your kids ready for anything, and when you have young kids, you're, you're constantly late to everything, right? Always. And you just, you finally get them all in the car, and then you look back, and one of them doesn't have any shoes on, and you're like, we're going out to eat. How do you possibly think you cannot wear shoes to this restaurant, right? That's almost how I picture this encounter, right? Finally, Moses is going, but it's like the staff's gone, right? And, and God's just like, Moses, buddy. The staff. How are you going to do these signs and wonders? You got to get the staff. Now, I know I'm stretching this a bit, but I'm really, really thankful that God is far more patient with me and you than I am with my own kids. And so we get from this whole encounter, from first to last, that God is incredibly patient. He's incredibly patient. Incredibly patient with Moses incredibly patient with us, incredibly patient with us. You know, this whole encounter between Moses and God reveals a lot about Moses, but it reveals more about who God is. And frankly, that is far more important because we put our faith in God, not in Moses. So I want to close with an observation and a question for us this morning. An observation and a question. The observations first, you can grow in your faith. You can grow in your faith. Moses did. What do we see here? We don't see a giant of the faith. We see a gnat of the faith. But we know Moses goes on to be a giant. Giants of the faith are not born. They grow they develop, and you can grow in your faith too. So don't look around and say, oh, look at that person. I wish I was like them. They have such mighty faith. 
I guarantee you, you talk to that person and they're going to say, oh, there was a rough road and there were seasons where I was a gnat of faith and God grew me up and, and you know, there's been hardship and there's been good times and there's been laughter and there's been tears and, and all kinds of things because they grew and you can grow to take encouragement from this. Take encouragement that you can grow in your faith. God is always calling. He's either calling us into his kingdom or he's calling us further into his kingdom, further up and further in. And mercifully, it's probably not to confront Pharaoh, okay? But that doesn't mean it's not going to take faith on your part to do your next step. And so that's the final question. What is your next step? What is God doing in your heart right now? Where is the next step for you in this journey of faith? How are you specifically going to grow up in this next season? Is it time to join a small group, even though you're shy, because you really want to see how the Bible is read by other people? Is it maybe time to tell your spouse, I love you, and I want to get some marriage counseling because I want our marriage to be strong and more joyful. Is it turning Netflix off 15 minutes early at night or shutting down whatever app that keeps you up at night so you can actually get up in time to read the Bible and pray before your day starts? Is it working hard at your job or at school even though your boss or your teacher doesn't appreciate you because you know you're working for the glory of God? and you wanna honor him. What's your next step? I can't tell you what your next step is. Your small group leader can't tell you what your next step is. We can put a, a, like a, a smorgasbord out there, but only the Holy Spirit working in your hearts and minds can lead you. This is where I want you to go next. This is what I want you to work on. What are you working on? What's your next step? And there may be some of you this morning who God's calling into his kingdom. Listen, God is holy, and we are sinful. We are broken. We are rebels. We are treasonous. And that is a dilemma for every single one of us. But God is loving, and he is powerful. He keeps his promises. He is the great I am. And praise be to God, he is merciful and patient with each and every one of us. Do you believe what he says is true? and that he can accomplish it in your lives? Do you believe it? So what I'd like to do in, in closing is I'm gonna read a few words of Jesus, then I'm gonna lead us into a time of prayer, but when we do that, can we go ahead and all of us go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes, not looking around, not distracted. I'm gonna read some words from Jesus over you, and I want you to think, do I trust him? Is he powerful enough to do it in my life? Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. John 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this, he says. And then finally, John 11, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Do you trust what he says? Is he able to accomplish it? Is he powerful enough? Listen, for those of you who maybe feel the call of God into his kingdom for the first time, I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in that prayer. It's a huge decision. It's an important decision. You maybe feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heartstrings even now. Now listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you for it. I'm not going to put a spotlight on you. I'm going to do none of that. But what I would like to do is to know who I'm praying with. And so I'm going to ask you as a sign of faith, if you're going to pray this prayer with me to put your trust and your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ, would you go ahead and just raise your hand this morning so I know who I'm praying with? Would you just go raise your hand again? I'm not going to embarrass you. You can go ahead and put those hands down. You can pray this prayer with me silently wherever you're at. Father God, you are holy. You are awesome. You are majestic. You are glorious. And I recognize that I am a sinner. I'm a rebel. 
and yet you love. And yet you love. And so I put my faith in you and your son, Jesus Christ, who can bring me to your glorious presence and make me one of your own children. I believe today and I'm walking with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's applaud those people who prayed that prayer with us this morning.